Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman of the Football History Dude Podcast, and I'm stopping by this show real quick to tell you about a couple of cool giveaways that we have going on here at the network. Both are autographed books covering various topics of the NFL. The first is The Point After, How One Resilient Kicker Learned There Is More to Life Than the NFL by ex-NFL kicker Sean Conley. It goes over his unique experience as a walk-on kicker at the University of Pitt after never playing high school football. And then it gets into some of his time playing for NFL teams and so much more beyond the gridiron. The other is from author Kevin Bryant. His book is titled Spies on the Sidelines, the High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. This book started as a curiosity, kind of a passion project to understand everything revolving around well, Spygate. But this put Kevin down a rabbit hole learning about all sorts of espionage that has occurred throughout the history of the NFL. Both permissible <laughs> and often the illicit techniques of gathering intel to try to impact the outcome of the game. To sign up for your chance to win an autographed copy of one of these books, all you gotta do is head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways and sign up. That's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Again, check out all the other podcasts that we have in the Sports History Network as well. But now, back to your regularly scheduled journey to the Sports History Timeline. Thanks everybody for tuning in to another week and another episode of One Guy with a Mic, Dingers and Dunks. So glad you're here. So glad to have you listening. Um, this week... You know, we lost the Major League Baseball trading deadline went by, and Juan Soto got traded to the Padres, Padres for a fleece of players. Wilson Contreras never, or Ian Happ never did get end up traded away from the Cubs. And I think the odds-on favorites has to be the Padres to win in the NL now that they will also be getting Fernando Tatis Jr. back at the end of the year or the end of the month. So that's going to have, have Machado, Tatis, and Soto in that lineup. Now that's going to be filthy. So this week uh, we're going to discuss, we lost a couple of great legends this week uh, with Vin Scully and Bill Russell both passing. And so as on Dingers and Dunks, we like to celebrate not only the current players that we have, um, but also we honor the ones that did play and the ones that we have lost. And Vince Scully may not have played. However, he was an integral part of baseball announcing. And not, not only just baseball announcing, but sports announcing in general as well. So before we get into the life and career of Vince Scully and Bill Russell, let's uh, start with a little did you know. So, did you know Dodger Stadium is the largest baseball stadium in the United States and the world? It seats 56,000 people and has a and has a thousand more seats than Estadio Latin America in Havana, Cuba. Oakland Coliseum, now known as Ring Central Coliseum, was the holder of that until at 63,132. But that was until the A's limited capacity to just over 47,000 seats. And let's be real. The A's are probably getting in about 13,000 people to show up every game as they are putting out a triple A team trying to force the city of Oakland to build them a stadium by putting a crappy ball club on the field. I probably would say that's probably not one of the best ways to do it. However, they have presented Oakland with numerous uh, with numerous different plans on how where to put a stadium, how to fund the stadium, everything else, and every time, just like with the Raiders, they deny it. Apparently, they just want the baseball to continue to be played in the crumbling Coliseum. Also, Fenway Park is the oldest and smallest park in baseball. Built in 1912, it seats... 37,200 or 731. Uh, that is the oldest and smallest park. But that brings me right into the did you know or 
uh, the this did you know brings me right into the this day in sports history, or in our case, baseball history. On August eighth, nineteen eighty eight, the first time lights ever came on at Wrigley Field. It was and the game was eventually called in the fourth inning with the Cubs leading the Mets three to one due to rain. So the official first game r- recorded for the night for a night game was on August 9th, nineteen eighty eight, and the Cubs beat the Mets six to four that night. So it's been forty jeez. It's been what, thirty four years since the lights have came on at Wrigley Field? Also ruined a really good uh, Statler Brothers song, by the way, uh, called Don't Wait On Me. If you, need, you should probably, uh, if you haven't heard that song, go listen to it. It's pretty hilarious. It's about a, about a guy who's telling his girlfriend he's only going to come back if certain things happen. And one of them was when the lights go on in Wrigley Field. So apparently they had to change the song up a little bit after that. <laughs> and and uh, you need to really listen to the live version of the Statler Brothers the Statler Brothers live CD or album or cassette if you have one of those uh, or if you can find it and really hear that part of it because the story that's told for it is is pretty funny so as I said that brings us to the past week when we lost two of our greats um, and like I said they, their lives weren't just about baseball or basketball i mean they they were integral in many facets with family and friends and and the sports world they brought love and excitement to everybody um they built they helped build sports cities and it all started you know when they were when they were young vin scully was born in the bronx new york's in on november 29th 1927 he went to Fordham Prep for high school, and then he went to Fordham University. He would later join the Navy and was part of the radio communications program. Vin called his first game in 1949 between the University of Maryland and Boston University at Fenway Park. It was a college football game. It was the first one he ever called. Uh, this got the attention of the CBS network, Red Barber. He was the sports director. And when Ernie Harwell left the Dodgers broadcast booth to go broadcast for the New York Giants, Vin was given the job, and he was only 22 years old at the time. Scully worked with Barber and Connie Desmond during this time, of until, and he worked with them up until Barber left, and then when L.A. went to, or when Brooklyn decided to move to L.A., uh, Connie Desmond didn't go with. And in 1953, he worked the World Series, which would have been his first World Series, with Mel Allen of the New York Yankees, as they would both broadcast it. Scully would do national games over the years, like the World Series and the All-Star Games. In fact, Sully holds the record for World Series called at 28. Joe Buck, I'm pretty sure might be able to break that, but Joe Buck's a really bad announcer in my opinion. He would also be the voice of the Saturday afternoon games of the week on NBC. And not like I said, not only did he do announce baseball games, but he did football games from 74 to 82. And he was the announcer for the infamous catch by Dwight Clark in the NFC Championship game against the Gal- against the Dallas Cowboys. He also has infamous calls of but- Buckner's air and Kirk Gibson's home run off two bad knees. He was with the Dodgers for 67 seasons, and that is a record for an announcer with one organization. During his time with the Dodgers, he would announce 20 no-hitters and three perfect games. He has earned awards for California Sportscaster of the Year 21 times, the Ford Frick Award in 1982. He got a Lifetime Achievement Emmy in 1995, 
and he named was named broadcaster of the century by American Sports Caster Association in 2000. He has been a Grand Marshal of the Tournament of Roses and given the Commissioner's Historic Achievement Award and is the second non-player to achieve that behind Miss Robinson, Jackie's wife. He also received a Presidential Medal of Freedom Award from Barack Obama, uh, Barack Obama, not Obama, Obama, in 2020, he auctioned off his personal memorabilia to raise $2 million to combat ALS, in which his wife passed from. Vince Scully was known as the last solo announcer when he retired, and the Dodgers' first three innings would simulcast, his, uh, simulcast him announcing on the radio and television at the same time hence the reason it's called a simulcast Chad Vin Scully will live on forever within with his famous calls and his soothe smooth voice that made it sound like he was talking directly to us the listener I never really had a chance to listen to Vin Scully call a game Uh, wasn't a Dodgers fan not really uh, not I really haven't gone into YouTube to listen to any of his former calls. Um, I was a little too young for the Gibson call. I was too young for the Buckner error. Um, So I don't really remember any of those infamous calls. But I do know that from hearing from Dodgers fans and hearing watching sports announcers um, and everybody just say how good he was tells you how how big of an impact he had had on people um Vin Scully like I said I never I never listened to I grew up with Harry Carey and I remember the day Harry Carey passed away um in before the 1998 season February 14th 1998 and he had a heart attack and I was 15 years old at the time and I felt like I lost my best friend because I uh, Harry Carey would listen, enlighten me with the Cubs games as much as Vin Scully, I'm sure, has enlightened everybody that has listened to him. So I, my heart goes out to the Scully family and and their loss, and also the loss that the sports world has has had um, with his passing. And we also have the other sports legend, Mr. Bill Russell. Man, Bill Russell. I didn't get to see him play. But as I have referenced many of times, my grandpa was a huge part of me and my sports endeavors as a kid, as a teenager, and as an adult, and still even after he has passed away. Still, the memories he gave me about watching and listening has been huge. Um, And one of the guys he always loved was Bill Russell. Always. He was a huge Bill Russell fan because of the way he played defense. He said he was pretty much the only guy that could defend the rim and still cover the backside. He could cover, cover the rim. He could cover the strong side where the ball was at. And he could cover the backside. He was a one-man wrecking crew. And he was fast from sideline to sideline. Oh, with Bill Russell, his number six being uh, from the Boston Celtics. And the San Francisco Dons, both of which have been retired. He wore number six in the 1956 Olympics, which that Olympic team went 8-0. And they would beat teams by an average of 53 and a half points per game. (laughs) So, y'all want to talk about the 1991 Dream Team? We're going to talk about the 1956 Olympic basketball team on one episode. 
after finding out what they did with Bill Russell and Casey Jones did to win a gold medal in Australia in Melbourne, Australia that year, it deserves a an episode. So Bill Russell, he he wasn't known much for his offense, and at the time, that was a at the time your forward and centers were your offense. Your guards would bring the ball up, dish it down low, and then you'd score your two buckets and go back on defense. But Bill Russell changed the ways the way that was. He basically was the guy that you could, even though he wasn't going to, I mean, he still averaged 15 points a game for a career. But he changed the way it was on defense. As, and at times, even the other coaches, like the Philadelphia Warriors coach, complained one time that he was playing a one-man zone and that, that he should be called for more fouls. So, unlike the likes of Mike and Chamberlain, Kareem, and Shaq, who are known as scorers of the game, and all over seven feet tall, Bill Russell at six foot ten could handle them all. He could manhandle these bad guys. He did it with Chamberlain, even though Chamberlain still averaged more points and more rebounds. However, at the end of the day, the Celtics would always win. Russell anchored the defense for the Celtics from 56 to 69. His last three years of his coaching from 67 to 69 was as, or as a player, was also as a head coach. He averaged 42.3 minutes per game, 22.5 rebounds per game. He had 4.3 assists per game. And like I said, he had 15.1 per, 1, 15.1 points per game. And as a big... He had 2.7 fouls per game. Blocks were not a stat at that time, but it said that he had seven blocks on average a game. And it wasn't like he would block it and it would go out of bounds. No, he would block it to where his teammate or himself would be able to get the ball and then transition into the uh, uh, transition to offense. That is what he was known for. He came second in the NBA Rookie of the Year voting behind Tommy Hennesson, his teammate with the Celtics. He had... (laughs) He had titles at the high school level, the NCAA level, where he won two of them in 55 and 56. He would go on to be drafted number two in the 56 draft after he decided not to sign with the Harlem Globetrotters. He was drafted by the St. Louis Hawks. And after he was drafted, Red Auerbach really wanted him because he felt like he was going to be the anchor to his defense. So what he did was he traded Ed McCauley, his perennial star at the time and center, but one who was from St. Louis and wanted to be home with his sick son traded him to St. Louis. And then the St. Louis owner comes back and felt like he didn't get enough out of the deal. Like he needed one more player for giving up Russell. So he asked for Cliff Hagen, a guy that had never, that hadn't played in three years due to military service. And so Russell was traded for Macaulay and Hagen. Like I said, he would go on to win 11 NBA championships in 13 years. He also did track and field in college where you've participated in the high jump and the 440 yard dash. He would retire in 1969, have his number six retired by the Boston Celtics in 72 and was inducted in the basketball hall of fame in 75. He would skip both of these ceremonies. Um, Bill Russell had a problem with media and just trust of others at times. And it was probably because of all the racial injustices that he suffered in the 50s and 60s and also growing up um, with his, and watching his parents endure it. And so sometimes as you're growing up, uh, you know, I don't, I wasn't, I can't say, I, I know what it's like. I'm not a black man in this country, so I have no idea what they're, what they go through, what black men and black women go through every day then or now 
But at some point, I'm pretty sure that takes a toll on you. And you have a lot of distrust for a lot of people. And when you get told one thing or told another thing and then it doesn't come true, you start to distrust PD, people and the media. And Bill Russell always felt like he was playing for the Boston Celtics and not for the city of Boston, which irked some Boston fans. But at the same time, th- he wasn't really showing love at times either during his career as he had his house in Massachusetts destroyed by Boston f- fans. And it's... He he wrote a book called Red and Me. And I didn't know that until now. But he's wrote, written a lot of books. I'm going to go out and find that book and I'm going to read it. Because Red Auerbach and Bill Russell have to be two of the most influential people to ever be. So, yeah. Um, and like I said, he averaged, you know, I'm guessing Russell was a man that was just caught up in a world. And like I said, he just trusts a lot of people. He would be part of the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s. He would fight behind, or he would back Muhammad Ali in not being being drafted and going to Vietnam. So, but as, after his basketball career ended, or I should not, yeah, his playing career ended, and he walked off the court uh, his, for his last time after winning Game Seven in L.A. and beating Wilt Chamberlain one more time. He would have a coaching stint with the Seattle Supersonics from 73 to 77. And he would have a record of 162 and 166 and led them to the first ever trip to the playoffs. And then he would go on to coach with the, he would go on and coach the Kings from 87 to 88. And it was uh, for the 87, 88 season and lasted 58 games before he was let go after a 17 and 41 season. He finished with a career coaching record of 341 and 290 and 34 and 27 in the playoffs. This would lead to him getting inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame as a coach in 2001, in which he would attend the ceremony at that time. Russell also tried many things outside of basketball. He owned a restaurant, he golfed, he was a vegetarian, he worked as a Cullen commentator and said that he couldn't give enough eight-second bites in order to be a good one because of the knowledge he has. He hosted an episode of SNL. Like I said, he wrote books. And even played a judge on Miami Vice. He would help at the request of Don Chaney, uh, the head coach of the LA Clippers and former team of his. He would try to help Benoit Benjamin as a, as a center in the 1985 he stayed away from the public limelight in the 90s and then at the turn of the millennium he would be more involved in basketball and life in general he helped end the feud between Shaq and Kobe he gave commencement speeches at Harvard and at the likes of Harvard and elsewhere he would be inducted as the member, as a member of the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame in its first class, and he also was inducted in FIBA's Hall of Fame first class as well. He had the Finals NBA MVP award named after him, and he was awarded a Presidential Medal of Freedom award in 2001, or 2011, by President Barack Obama. Russell was considered the consummate defensive center, noted for his defensive intensity, basketball IQ, and will and will to win. He excelled excelled at playing man to man defense, blocking shots, and grabbing rebounds. He could score with putbacks and mate and <clears throat> would make mid air outlet passes to Bob Cousy for his fast breaks. He was a fine passer and pick and roll setter. And he has a left-handed hook shot, which my grandpa loved. He loved guys that could be shoot left-handed. And I couldn't guard my, gra- my grandpa's left-handed hook shot. I would hate to see if 
so, if somebody could be able to guard his uh, Russell's left-handed cook shock. Jeez. His five final MVP, his five NBA MVP awards is tied with Michael Jordan and is behind Kareem Abdul-Jabbar with six. He made four all, or he made three all NBA first teams and eight second teams, and is a 12 time All Star. He's one of three players to ever make the 25th, 35th, 50th, and 75th anniversary teams, and he's ranked number 18 on the ESPN's 50 Greatest Athletes of the 20th Century in 1999. And he was also voted by ESPN as the third best center of all time between behind Kareem and Wilt. And he was named Slam's third best player of all time between behind Jordan and Chamberlain. So, um, of Russell, former NBA player and head coach Don Nelson, who played against Russell in the one of the NCAA championships, uh, it said there are two types of superstars. One makes himself look good at the expense of other guys on the floor, but there's another type who makes the players around him look better than they are, and that's the type Russell was. Russell had has a statue erected at City Hall Plaza, re- surrounded by eleven uh, plinths representing his eleven championships, and each plinth features a key word, a related quote to illustrate Russell's multiple accomplishments. He also has. He was, also has the West Coast Conference Russell Rule I've named after him as well. Um, the West Coast Conference is where his alma mater, U- the University of Francis, San Francisco, plays, and they adopted the Russell Rule, which requires each member institution to include a member of a traditionally unrepresented community in the pool of final candidates for every athletic director, senior administrator, head coach, and full-time assistant coach position in the athletic department. So, there you have it. Two legends that have influenced people on and off the court, the field, the press box. And guys I am hoping I can find YouTube videos on so I can go back back and watch them this this upcoming week. um, As always, thanks for everybody tuning in. Um, I appreciate everybody that listens. I appreciate everybody that finds us. Always hit the the follow button, the ring the bell to subscribe. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on TikTok. Follow me on Twitch. One guy with a mic sportscast this is the what's on Twitch. One guy with a mic is everywhere else. Instagram. I really haven't been posting a lot lately. It's just been a summer where I've just been trying to enjoy myself. So there's so that's been so. Going to start posting more stuff coming up, you know, as soon as I get done doing golf tournaments and everything with my crazy cousin that I golf with. So, all right. Tell somebody you love them, guys, and hug somebody. Have a good day. It was just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor... Everything was about to change, for she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items, thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. 
But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delt discovered the spondiferous magic of Row 1 Sports Memorabilia Arts and Prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row 1 catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act A for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon. Oh, yes,